Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our live chat. And today we're going to be having a conversation about I Envision Health Innovations. I'm Prescott Stokes III, the Integrated Content and Marketing Manager here at the TCU and UNT HSC School of Medicine. And today I am here with Dr. Shai Savala. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. All right. Dr. Shavala is an ophthalmologist and also a professor of surgery here at the School of Medicine. And I am also happy to be here with Dr. Mohinder Mershea. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. All right. Dr. Mershea is an optometrist in North American Medical Affairs at Alcon. And I want to say that Alcon is the global leader in eye care and offers the widest array of surgical eye care health, contact lenses, and contact lens care products in the industry. Their headquarters is in Geneva, Switzerland, but the North America regional headquarters is right here in Fort Worth with us, <laughs> where they also have a research and development and manufacturing facilities on site. And I also want to say that Alcon is also one of the founding donors of our medical school's ophthalmology program. So our guests will answer any questions you have about eye and vision health. All you need to do is jump into the comments section, leave your question, and I will definitely get you some answers. But before we get to the questions, I am going to begin with Dr. Shavala. So Dr. Shavala, you are the lead investigator on a brand new study that was published in Nature last month where you and a team of researchers were able to restore vision in blind mice. Can you tell us about the significance of that discovery? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Prescott. I want to thank you for inviting me to uh, participate. Uh, so I'm very, very fortunate to be a part of this extraordinary team of researchers all across uh, the country. Some at the National Institute of Health, uh, some right here in Fort Worth and uh, in Bedford, Texas. Um, and uh, we all got together. And uh, this started out as a, uh, a passion project for me extremely frustrated with uh, seeing individuals, patients with retinal degeneration uh, that uh, were blind and not being able to offer them any, any treatments. And so um, we got really excited about reading what's going on with stem cells. And we thought, wow, is there a way that we could do something similar with just something like skin cells? And we chose skin cells because they're easily accessible. Um, you can grow them very easily. And what we were able to do in our nature paper was that we were able to describe a technique where we can add five small molecules. And it's almost like magic, <laughs> but we can chemically convert the skin cells into retinal cells. And in the paper, we took those cells that we converted in just less, in less than two weeks, we put them back into blind mice, and we were able to restore visual function. Interesting. That sounds really, really interesting. Now, this research, now, although you guys are able to restore the vision in the blind mice, if this research actually moves to human trials, can you tell us who would benefit from it the most? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we're, we're aiming um, to target uh, individuals with no treatments. So uh, it would be patients with irreversible vision loss, those with um, dry or advanced macular degeneration, um, and inherited forms of retinal degeneration. Uh, essentially, anyone who has lost vision from uh, the loss of photoreceptors, uh, those are the cells in the retina that turn uh, light into an electrical impulse. Anyone that has lost vision from that could potentially benefit from this therapy. And we talked a little bit, and, and you kind of discussed with me about dry macular degeneration. But just for our audience, can you just explain exactly what dry macular degeneration is? And for people with dry macular degeneration, what are the current treatment options that they have? Yeah, so macular degeneration is the most common cause of irreversible blindness in the Western world. Um, and we recommend that uh, individuals who are at risk or who may have a family member with macular degeneration get a dilated eye exam because uh, we can detect uh, macular degeneration even when individuals are asymptomatic, uh, they're seeing fine, have no, uh, have no loss of vision. We can actually detect what are called drusen, these yellow deposits in, in the retina that are the earliest signs of, of dry macular degeneration. And we can um, encourage them to take eye vitamins and, um, you know, change their diet potentially uh, to eat a lot of green leafy vegetables um, to potentially ward off advanced disease. 
Um, and so in, within macular degeneration, there are two types. There's a dry type and then there's a wet type. And it turns out about 20% of individuals with the dry type go on to develop the wet type. And the wet type is characterized by abnormal blood vessels underneath the retina. And those blood vessels can leak fluid or blood. Um, and we have some really exciting therapies that uh, we can do to uh, prevent uh, vision degeneration for the wet type. But unfortunately for the advanced dry type, that, that uh, leads to cell loss. And so those photoreceptor cells die. And unfortunately when they die, there's no way to replace those. Um, and so that's part of what our research focuses on. Right, and so I see why this research is, is so important um, once you, someone comes up with dry macular degeneration because it, it, you talked to me a little bit about quality of life, right? And, and that's what you're really trying to restore, right? Exactly, exactly. So, uh, you know, improving vision on an eye chart is one thing, uh, but being able to improve someone's quality of life, their ability to read, drive, give them independence again, is really what we're after. Um, is to improve quality of life. And um, in general, in eye health, um, eye health is really important because we can actually detect uh, systemic diseases as well. So we can detect diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, things that an indiv individual may feel are under control. Um, we can actually detect um, organ damage by looking at the eye. Uh, and it's, it's a very simple thing to do with a dilated eye exam. So we highly encourage um, individuals that have any of those potential diseases to have a dilated eye exam um, to see if there's any, any uh, potential eye damage. And I'm so happy that, that we're having this conversation today because when we spoke previously, um, there's a lot of things that don't get a lot of um, attention in the medical world as, as far as eye care. And so understanding um, the importance of eye care and how eye care can actually uh, help detect other things as well just shows how important it is and how important uh, your research is. So I want to tell everyone who's watching, if you have any questions about eye health, eye innovations, anything of that nature, just jump into the comments, leave your question, and I will get you some answers. So now I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk to Dr. Mershea about eye health innovations with Alcon. So Dr. Mershea, how does the, the Alcon R&D process work and how do you all go about developing new products in the eye care space? Uh, thank you, Prescott. Hey, first off, uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate uh, uh, in this uh, Facebook Live session with uh, Dr. Tavala. Uh, fantastic to hear some of the great research that he's doing, uh, uh, definitely making a difference there. Um, you know, obviously Alcon's very, very proud to be part of the Fort Worth community and also uh, to be a partner with the medical school and the ophthalmology program. So uh, great to be here. Um, regarding your question, like Alcon for 75 years has been delivering uh, innovation in eye care by trying to bring uh, vision correction, uh, ocular health, uh, uh, and ocular health options uh, to help patients see better um, uh, and to improve their quality of life, similar to um, you know, several of the comments that Dr. Shvala made. Um, you know, we, we recognize that there's continued need for innovation in eye health. Uh, in particular, you know, we, we know that the WHO reports that 80% of visual impairment is preventable or curable. Dr. Javala was focused on the other side where, you know, the, you can't really change it once the AMD takes effect, but uh, where Alcon's focus is really on, you know, the, the 20 million odd patients uh, uh, globally that are afflicted by cataracts, uh, the 153 million that are afflicted by uncorrected refractive error, most frequently myopia, uh, and the 1.7 billion that actually suffer from presbyopia, which we'll be talking a little bit about later. Um, at Alcon, we have roughly 1,300 uh, employees within uh, our R&D function worldwide, uh, and they're focused on over 110 projects in that development pipeline. Uh, all targeted at bringing new innovations to the market. Uh, 2019 alone, uh, Alcon invested uh, about 584 million uh, in those R&D projects, uh, really looking to the future to bring that next generation of products in. Um, and we're focused on trying to bring those solutions in in multiple therapeutic areas, uh, from contact lenses to dry eye and allergy, to cataract, to refractive surgery, as well as the back of the eye where Dr. Shavala is working in terms of vitreoretinal surgery. 
And you mentioned presbyopia, which is farsightedness. You know, people get blurred vision, eye strain, headaches, those kind of things. Why is it important to have vision solutions to correct presbyopia? Well, in the United States alone, we have about 123 million Americans that are suffering from presbyopia. Uh, and what that is, is the inability of the eye to focus up close, even if distance vision is clear. Uh, normal part of aging, it happens typically somewhere between 40 and 45. Uh, when the natural lens loses uh, uh, its clarity, it starts to become cloudy, as well as loses its flexibility due to some cross-linking of the proteins within the normal crystalline lens. Uh, some of the first signs that we see clinically uh, of patients complaining about this is uh, typically things will start moving further out as they're holding them trying to read, whether that's an iPhone or a book, um, and then eventually they're getting all the way out to uh, arm's length just to be able to read even though their distance vision uh, may be uh, clear. Uh, historically, this has been corrected uh, uh, or mitigated uh, uh, by using uh, spectacle lenses or uh, no, you know, no line uh, uh, progressive lenses or even just going to the drugstore and picking up a, a pair of readers. Um, anybody that's had to deal with readers and taking glasses on and off simply to read, uh, particularly if they have normal uh, distance vision, um, you know, or they've had their phone and they've had to change the text size and increase it just so you can see it, uh, or had to hand a menu to somebody else uh, that's younger in a restaurant to read it to them, uh, knows the impact of presbyopia, um, both from an inconvenience perspective, but as well from uh, an emotional perspective. Uh, so certainly a big impact on quality of life. Right. Um, and what is, is there anything special or different about press biopic patients from, from other eye patients? Well, I, I think both I and Dr. Shavala can probably attest to this and in, in, that we've seen press biopic patients or patients that emerge in a press biopic for the first time. And um, nothing is, is uh, as amusing sometimes as when a patient uh, first experiences those symptoms and doesn't understand why. Uh, it, particularly when their distance vision may be clear. Um, you know, their, their perception of vision changes can be sudden, even though this is a, a process that is slow and progressive and occurs over time. Um, most often they don't realize that there might even be alternatives uh, to those reading glasses once the symptoms onset and they understand that there might be a solution for them. Uh, and that's where contact lenses or presbyopia mitigating interocular lenses come in. And interocular lenses are basically uh, uh, an artificial lens that replaces uh, the crystalline lens within the eye. Um, these are all great options beyond spectacle lenses to help correct for presbyopia. Uh, and Alcon's uh, obviously focused on those areas simply because they're very, uh, very much life-changing events uh, uh, in terms of managing presbyopia. Uh, and uh, Alcon R&D here, particularly even in Fort Worth, uh, we've had two uh, uh, breakthrough products uh, that were developed uh, 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 here as well as at some of our global centers uh, for R&D, uh, and that's the Daily's Total One Multifocal and the Panoptics Trifocal Interocular Lens, uh, both which are products targeted at mitigating uh, presbyopia. All right, that is wonderful information. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcia. I want to let everybody know that we're having a chat about eye and vision health innovations. If you have any questions related, you can jump in the comment section, leave your question, and I will definitely get you some answers since I have two phenomenal doctors here with me. Um, so I want to switch gears one more time and go back to Dr. Shavala. So Dr. Shavala, let's talk a little bit more about your, your research. So um, you mentioned that the technique to turn skin cells into these light sensing rod photoreceptors in the retina of the eye is kind of like making a, a little bit of a cocktail, you said. Can you tell us um, how that works? Uh, yeah, so uh, in theory, what we, what we hope to do is that we, we want to identify individuals that are suffering from retinal degeneration take a biopsy of their skin, which is a five or 10 minute procedure and can be done at pretty much any dermatologist's office, um, and then expand or grow those skin cells and then add our five small molecules um, to change those skin cells into retinal cells. And the advantage of doing it per individual is that then those cells are genetically matched per patient. And so the immune system is less likely to reject those cells. Um, and then the idea would be then to take those 
modified skin cells from that individual and surgically uh, implant them into the retina uh, using uh, vitrectomy, which is the standard retinal surgery um, uh, that, that's done very commonly. And you also mentioned, uh, mentioned to me that there are also um, some, some dangers, right, when you're trying to take cells from one part of the body and put them in a different part of the body. So why are skin cells better to use than stem cells in this type of uh, eye treatment? Uh, could you repeat that question? Sorry, there was a second. Yeah. No, I said that you mentioned to me that there are some, some dangers that you have to be aware of, right, um, when you're moving cells from one part of the body to another. So can you tell us why skin cells are better to use than stem cells in this particular treatment? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, the issue with stem cells is that it can take up to a year, um, nine months to a year, to actually uh, use them and coax those stem cells into retinal cells. Um, and and that's, that's, that's frustrating for, for patients who are suffering from this disease to tell them that you know, they might have a therapy uh, that is personalized to them in a year. Um, so in our, in our system, we don't use stem cells at all. And that's one of the big advantages is that we can skip stem cells um, and we can generate these personalized cells within two weeks. And we've actually generated uh, these cells from uh, healthy donors, uh, human healthy donors, and also from patients suffering from eye disease. So we know we can do that in humans, um, we're, we're now trying to um, perform um, the, the experiments that are necessary for the FDA to allow us to test the technology in, in patients suffering from eye disease. All right, all right. And so Dr. Mershea, um, can I talk to you just a little bit more about some of your eye health innovation? So how does Alkine address the unique needs of, of contact lens wearers as they develop press biopia. Yeah, thanks, Prescott. Um, well, what we know is at the time that press biopia develops, uh, most patients that are wearing contact lenses tend to drop out. Um, and that frequently occurs uh, with an increase of symptoms related to dryness and uh, general discomfort with that lens wear uh, being cited as the main reason. Um, so what we know is that patients need contact lenses that support both comfort and clear vision at all distances, uh, particularly in that age group when uh, presbyopia takes a hold. So understanding this confluence of needs, um, you know, we've been able to focus our development on uh, contact lenses such as the Daily's Total One uh, Multifocal uh, or DT1 Multifocal. Um, that lens is made up uh, of a unique material, um, and, and what it is is a novel water gradient uh, technology. So it has, uh, throughout its thickness, different levels and concentrations of water reaching nearly 100% at the surface. Um, and what that, what that does is provide exceptional comfort uh, uh, based off of that outer surface, but allows us to also implement fantastic optics that give you clear vision at distance, intermediate, and near ranges. Uh, they're designed for wearers that need that comfort and that uh, 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 great visual acuity performance and want a contact lens to feel like wearing nothing. Uh, based on some large-scale uh, patient surveys that we've completed on, on wearers of uh, uh, Daily's Total One that, that have presbyopia, um, we know that wearing readers uh, or reading glasses makes people feel older um, and even worse, using readers uh, makes others perceive you about 10 years older. Um, and, and that's the last thing any of us need is someone saying that we look old. Um, the same survey, uh, when those patients were then, uh, you know, utilizing Daily's Total One, uh, the majority of them, over 52%, uh, and, and these were US patients, reported strongly agreeing or agreeing that they felt younger just by using Daily's Total One multifocal. So if you think about that from a lifestyle perspective and quality of life perspective, it's, it's pretty remarkable that simply using a contact lens that gives you the freedom from putting readers on and off uh, gives you that benefit of, of feeling and, and uh, being able to do tasks that uh, uh, you know, a younger person can do more uh, efficiently and effectively. And this is just a, a great conversation because I, I like the fact that you guys are actually talking about some of the stigma that, that goes around people wearing glasses and just given the numbers on some of these studies that I, even I wasn't aware of that. 
um, and, and why people feel, you know, maybe less confident if they end up needing glasses at some point in their life. So that is really good information. Um, Dr. Mercia, I also want you to talk to us a little bit about panoptics, which is the first and only trifocal lens for U.S. patients undergoing cataract surgery. So how do you all use it? Right. Well, panoptics is a presbyopia mitigating interocular lens, or IOL. Uh, and as I was mentioning earlier, it's implanted in the eye to replace the natural crystalline lens after a cataract develops. Uh, and, and the cataract is where the lens gets clouded and, and becomes harder, which is where you also consequently have a less ability to focus at near. Um, cataracts are a normal part of aging. Anyone that lives long enough is going to get them. Um, but ultimately, the result of the cataract is... Uh, not only a reduction in visual acuity, but visual quality. So, uh, you know, things look duller, colors are faded, uh, your night vision might not be uh, quite as, uh, as good as when you were younger. Um, again, the number one uh, cause of preventable blindness, and there's no cure per se, but the surgical procedure that's used to address cataracts is one of the most successful uh, uh, and common uh, elective surgical procedures in the U.S., the getting that IOL in place is, is really a life-changing event for most people. Um, and, and it's like cleaning the windshield off of a car or kind of opening the drapes. Um, uh, as you know, Dr. Chavala's work is really at making sure the retina is fixed and uh, able to receive that light. Our work is to get the light to the retina um, and make sure that uh, it's focused there properly and, and lets patients uh, see clearly. Um, and, and what we know and hear from patients that are using panoptics is similar to the, the story I was telling you with DT1. You know, they tell us that it helps them uh, with feeling younger uh, and that they can return to activities that they enjoy uh, without having to wear glasses, uh, uh, even for uh, activities like reading. And Dr. Mercier, you said uh, when you talk about panoptics, what exactly makes panoptics an innovative IOL option for people who actually have cataracts? Yeah, and as you had mentioned, it, it's the first and only uh, trifocal uh, IOL that's approved in the United States for the uh, cataract patients. Uh, and what that means uh, in terms of trifocal is that it has three focal points where the lens provides clear vision. So far, such as when you're watching a movie, intermediate, like when you're using a computer, and near, um, maybe when you're looking at your watch or your cell phone. Um, it's a next generation uh, interocular lens that kind of overcomes the limitations of prior generation multifocal uh, IOLs, uh, where those IOLs were not only, uh, were not able to provide distance intermediate and near uh, clarity from a single uh, lens. Um, what we've done with Panoptics is actually transform this IOL uh, type of technology in Panoptics uh, using a proprietary optical design called Enlightened Technology. Uh, and what that does is optimize the light energy distribution as it goes through the IOL and is focused in the back of the eye to deliver distance intermediate and near with no compromise. Um, unlike other IOL technologies, uh, you know, uh, what's unique about panoptics is that that intermediate distance uh, is set at about 60 centimeters. That, that's the uh, focal length for typically using a computer, as we were talking about. Uh, it's also the one that's um, uh, recognized as OSHA as being the most common for that uh, intermediate working distance. Um, the design also provides uh, a very high level of light utilization. So more than 88% of the light actually going through the IOL um, and reaches the retina and is usable. Uh, and that helps provide great function in a variety of lighting environments from bright light during the day to dim light when you're inside a restaurant, for example. So these innovations together uh, have helped provide, uh, you know, that typical 2020 vision that you hear from the doctor when you go and sit in their exam chair uh, at distance, intermediate, and near uh, for many cataract patients. Great information. And I also want to let everybody know you can jump in the comments and leave your questions and I will get you some answers. And actually, we are going to go to a few of those questions right now. So um, this is actually a pretty good conversation because we are bringing optometrists and ophthalmologists 
together to have a conversation about eye health and vision innovations. We have a question from Ben Jacob who says that do optometrists and ophthalmologists collaborate frequently? Um, and I guess Ben just wants to know because we have a lot of medical students in the audience watching and incoming uh, medical students watching. So can either of you guys talk about how uh, both worlds kind of collaborate? Sure, I can, I can answer that one. Um, so I, I currently practice at Climate Evangelista um, here in the Metroplex. Uh, we have locations um, all over, uh, including the mid-cities and, and, and in Dallas. And our practice is designed to be holistic. Uh, we want to provide the most uh, comprehensive treatments, um, uh, whether it's in the front of the eye uh, with refractive surgery and LASIK uh, to, um, to clear lens extraction, to cataract extraction. Um, and I'm happy to say we use Alcon uh, technologies as well. So. Um, and um, in our practice, um, we have optometrists and ophthalmologists working alongside to provide um, provide a, um, a really comprehensive experience for, for the uh, patient. And we find that that works quite well um, to, to have optometrists and ophthalmologists working alongside one another. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think uh, the, the collaboration between optometry and ophthalmology is, is fantastic. Uh, and I can certainly speak from a research environment uh, whether that's product development or just independent clinical research, uh, the collaboration between uh, uh, both professions uh, has really contributed to some of the uh, fantastic products that uh, you know Alcon is able to bring to to market, uh, as well as uh, the the treatments that are applied. Uh, you know, once uh, uh, patients are are receiving care, uh, whether that's in the OR with the ophthalmologist or uh, you know in that primary care setting with the optometrist, uh, there, there's great collaboration. And we, we've actually gotten quite a few questions while you guys have been discussing all of this great information um, about eye and vision health. So Amy has a question that I think maybe you can answer, Dr. Mercia. Amy says, I have dry eye and I can't wear contacts. Is there any new research or breakthroughs for dry eye? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I'll start off by first saying, go see your optometrist uh, and, and make sure that they understand that you're having issues. Um, there's a number of factors that need to be considered. Obviously, the, the health of the eye being first and foremost. And, and by that, I don't simply mean, uh, does the contact lens fit, can you see clearly, but the ocular surface. So the ocular surface, meaning the, the white of the eye, the conjunctiva, uh, the, the cornea, uh, uh, the eyelids themselves, the meibomian glands, which are glands within the eyelid that secrete uh, a portion of the tear film that helps to lubricate the eye and prevent uh, some of the dryness symptoms that you may be experiencing. Um, the health of all of those structures need to be um, managed first and foremost uh, before the contact lens. So there is a lot of research ongoing that shows that if you manage ocular surface disease uh, and you, you address the dry eye symptoms first, uh, that you can improve uh, contact lens wearing experience. You can certainly improve the duration of time that a patient is able to stay in a contact lens through one day, let alone the lifetime of wear of a contact lens. Uh, and then certainly there are contact lens technologies as we've discussed, um, you know, like DT1, uh, that can help with those symptoms of dryness uh, as, as patients are uh, needing uh, that correction, you know, particularly at the end of the day. Good information. Um, we have some more questions to go through. Thank you, everybody, for submitting your questions, and we are going to get you some answers. So, Dr. Shavala, I have a question for you from Gail Teagle. Thank you for your question, Gail. And her question is, do you think your research could also extend to regain vision loss from glaucoma? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so, to share a short story with you, um, we weren't looking to... to to try to uh, innovate in the glau in glaucoma, uh, but um, our lead scientist was actually performing experiments that um, that we needed to do for for our research paper. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, he uh, added the small molecules um, in the wrong sequence. And rather than starting over and throwing away that dish, um, we looked at that uh, seven days later, and it turned out we had cells that are important for for glaucoma in the dish. Um, so now we're really excited about that, um, that serendipitous uh, discovery. 
and uh, we're, we're really looking at opportunities to improve uh, vision or, or, or more likely prevent further degeneration in glaucoma. All right, um, Dr. Shavala, we also have a question for you from Judy. Thank you for your question, Judy. Uh, so she says, Dr. Shavala's research is very exciting, exclamation point. <laughs> uh, when will some of the things that <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, she wants to know when will some of the things that you are discovering start to be used clinically? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, so that's one of my main focuses. Um, we started a company called uh, CIRC Therapeutics. CIRC stands for Chemically Induced Retinal Cells. Um, and, and the whole purpose of starting that company was to bring this to the clinic. Uh, that's been my life dream as a, uh, a clinician to uh, take things from the lab and translate them from bench to bedside. Uh, so right now we're, we're looking for funding. Um, that, that's really our, our main goal. That's the only thing that we're really missing um, is to, uh, to have um, significant research funding to be able to do the experiments that are necessary to, um, uh, for the FDA to provide us permission to test uh, this technology in humans. And this is why we're having this, this type of live chat in this open forum so people can understand the information and hopefully it can help in the end. Uh, Dr. Mercea, we had another question that came in um, for El uh, about Elcon, and the question is, how has Elcon given back to the community during the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, you know, obviously, uh, Elcon supports uh, all the charitable partners that we work with, and uh, you know, we we try and help to serve the most vulnerable populations during this uh, unfortunate outbreak that we're we're all suffering through. Uh, specifically, the Alcon Foundation um, has donated to uh, local, national, and global organizations to support things like meal programs for children and seniors, uh, as well as provide uh, essential supplies to shelters and uh, aided with um, you know, other public health agencies for emergency relief. Um, it, you know, specifically in the Fort Worth area, uh, you know, we've manufactured uh, PPE. Uh, including uh, hand sanitizer and splash guards uh, and provided those as donations to first responders in, in our own community, uh, including at, uh, you know, Baylor and, and the local police department, uh, for example. All right. Great community work by you guys. Uh, we all appreciate it here in the Fort Worth community. Um, we have another question. I want to thank everybody for jumping in the comments and leaving your questions so we can get you some answers about eye health. This is a very important discussion. So we have another question from Gail Teagle uh, for Dr. Mercea. Uh, the question is, do we know why patients sometimes experience optical aberrations from the panoptics IOL? Uh, it, interesting question, obviously, um, you know, one that's gonna be very specific to a, a given patient. The, the IOL itself um, doesn't necessarily induce um, a, a significant change in the aberration profile of a patient. So what are aberrations is probably where we should start. Um, it, what that is is basically a distortion in uh, the visual quality uh, as light passes through some type of an optical system. Um, most frequently, we think of aberrations affecting the cornea which is typically where about 95% of the aberrations that affect the visual system come from. Um, the lens uh, has a minor contribution, uh, particularly as it ages and a cataract develops. Once it's taken out, the cornea typically remains being the, the major source of those aberrations. So even when an interocular lens is put in place, uh, many of those aberrations may simply be a residual effect of uh, the cornea. Now, Aberrations could also mean something on the lines of um, halo and glare. Uh, now those are uh, symptoms that uh, patients with cataracts report as well as patients with intraocular lenses report. Now the type of interocular lens that Panoptics is, which is a trifocal or a presbyopia mitigating IOL, uh, uh, compared to a distance only correcting uh, monofocal IOL, um, may have different levels of halo uh, complaints, typically. Um, and all patients should be counseled prior to surgery, cataract surgery, with these types of presbyopia mitigating IOLs, that they may experience some level of halo and glare. Now, that being said, with the, the research that's been done on panoptics in the FDA trial, uh, as well as in the more than 20 peer-reviewed publications that have been done globally, 
uh, utilizing uh, the Panoptix IOL, the relative uh, impact or severeness of halos and glare where they lead to disability and performance or lifestyle is still very low with panoptics. Uh, but will a patient have halo and glare potentially? Uh, that, that is something that needs to be discussed between a patient and their surgeon. All right, great information. Um, and while that was going on, we also had an additional question come in for Dr. Shivala. Uh, you mentioned this earlier, but I just want to let you restate it again. So Dr. Shivala, the question from our viewer, viewer is, uh, what needs to happen next for this treatment to become widely available for patients? Uh, yeah, so we, we would need to uh, um, engage in clinical trials where um, we, we test uh, the therapy um, in a small group of patients with um, macular degeneration or uh, what's called retinitis pigmentosa, which is a genetic cause of blindness, uh, to see if it can actually improve vision um, uh, and to also make sure that it's safe and it doesn't cause any harm. Um, so, I mean, at this stage, I think the most important thing is to encourage people, uh, you know, uh, to come in and have, have an eye exam by an eye care professional. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to see um, individuals um, and evaluate them for refractive errors as well as retinal issues um, as well. All right. Great information. And actually, that will do it for today's live chat. I want to thank Dr. Shavala, and I also want to give a big thanks to Dr. Mershea. We appreciate both of you joining us and having this important conversation about eye and vision health innovations. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for having us. Yeah. All right. I also want to thank everyone on Facebook for being a part of today's live chat. And we appreciate it. And we will see you all soon. Thank you for watching.